Hello, and the purpose of this video is to critically review the religious policies of the Emperor Constantius II, who was the Arian Emperor, right? And his uh, actual name was Flavius Julius Constantius, and uh, he was uh, in power from 337 to 361, and he was a successor, of course, of Constantine. Um, and uh, what is notorious, of course, about Constantius II is that he was Arian. He was the Arian emperor. So that is why I want to review his, uh, critically review his religious policies. Uh, his policies touched on Christianity, paganism, and Judaism. So uh, I'm going to briefly look. I'm not going to pay too much attention to the um, policies concerning paganism. I'm going to focus more on the policies concerning Christianity and Judaism uh, because, as uh, you might know, uh, the person who really touched upon the issue of paganism was Constantius II's successor, Julian. Of course, I talked about Marcus Aurelius, who I believe was the philosopher emperor in the Platonic sense. Marcus Aurelius, you know, he was uh, not only emperor of Rome, for, but also a major Stoic philosopher. And... Um, yeah, so, and for many years I was interested in Stoic philosophy because of the influence of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, specifically his writings called Commentaries. Um, but uh, in ensuing years I moved away from uh, Stoicism. I, I'm considering a return to Stoicism now, though, but that's something separate. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, the other emperor that I was inspired by very much is, of course, Julian. Uh, the Emperor Julian has always been an inspiration to me uh, for many, many years. Um, Flavius Claudius Julianus. And it is, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is propaganda. It is actually propaganda, Catholic propaganda, when they say that he was an apostate. He was not an apostate, okay? Uh, it was the early Catholic Church who were the apostates. Uh, the Nicene Christians are the apostates because their theology is premised upon the lies of the Trinity and the lie that Jesus is God. So it was the Catholic Church who were the apostates. What I disagree with the Emperor Julian is though his solution, that he wanted to restore you know, the, the uh, paganism that existed under the Antonines. I don't think that was possible in his time because the majority of ordinary people were Christian. You know, Christianity, you could, you could not unring a bell. You know, uh, Christianity had already become the dominant religion in the empire by the time he was emperor. So, you know, it was kind of like wrongheaded. But in the, in the, um, I, my argument is that the emperor Julian should have become a restorationist uh, and restore the theology and ecclesiology and, you know, of the first century Christian congregation. That would have been better than trying to, uh, you know, uh, revive or paganism that was not possible to revive anymore. So if had the Emperor Julian become a restorationist uh, of, uh, you know, pre-Nicene uh, Christendom, if he had embraced not just Arianism, but other aspects of the theology of the first century congregation, he would have become a great restorationist emperor. He would have, he would have uh, sort of like continued on the, on the foundation set by the Emperor Constantius II. And he would have built. However, you know, Julian came to power in revolt against Constantius II because Julian was neo-pagan and Constantius II was Arian. Back to the uh, religious policies of Constantius II, who was the Arian emperor. And um, I'm going to touch first very briefly on the pagan um, uh, policies of it. Uh, you know, pagan temples were shut down. The actor, altar of victory was removed from the Senate meeting house in Rome. Uh, yeah, there were also frequent episodes of ordinary Christians destroying, pillaging, and desecrating many ancient pagan temples, tombs, and monuments, you know, whatever. I mean, paganism was still popular among the population at the time, you know, um, and because of this, the emperor's policies were passively resisted by many governors and magistrates. So, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, what I've said earlier about the emperor Julian trying to restore paganism, it is true. It is true that paganism was still popular among the population, but not enough of the population was pagan that you could like revive paganism in the sense that Julian wanted. But that's a separate issue. Um, yeah. 
Constantius the second legislation began with the banning of the pagan practice of sacrifice and you know the emperor Tiberius is the one who banned human sacrifices in the empire but uh, yeah uh, Constantius uh, went further and banned all pagan sacrifices yeah um, under the uh, rubric of ceasing superstition right um, let superstition cease let the folly of sacrifices be abolished according to the emperor constantius ii cesset superstitio hmm? sacrificiorum aboleatur insania let superstition cease let the folly of sacrifices be abolished so yeah um uh yeah so yeah, I don't know. Consistent, consistent with Christian theology, Constantius carried out on an active campaign against magicians, astrologers, and other diviners. And I believe at the time of the Emperor Julian, it was illegal to like uh, tell the fortune of the emperor. So if you were, uh, an, you know, you couldn't use the augurs to like foretell the death of the emperor, for example, that was illegal. Um, so yeah, magicians, astrologers, and diviners were cracked on. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, fearful that others might use these means to make someone else emperor, uh, right? Removal of the actor altar of victory in the Senate House because of the complaints of some Christian senators, 357. This altar had been installed by Augustus himself in 29 BC. So each senator had originally made a sacrifice upon the altar before entering the Senate House. Yeah, so... Um, this altar was later restored either silently soon after Constantius' departure or by the Emperor Julian, right? By Julian. Let's see, the policies concerning Christianity is what matters. And I'm, 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 of course, looking at Wikipedia. And the reason I'm looking at Wikipedia is not because I'm intellectually lazy. I know there is other sources. And I'm going to try to look, put, put links in the description to articles concerning Constantius II from Encyclopedia Britannica so you can, you know, corroborate things. The reason I am using Wikipedia is because Jehovah's Witnesses say that Wikipedia is edited by demons, so I use Wikipedia. Policies concerning Christianity, and this is an interesting uh, comment here. Although often considered an Arian, Constantius ultimately preferred a third compromised version that lay somewhere in between Arianism and the Nicene Creed, retrospectively called semi-Arianism. Uh, you know, my view on semi-Arianism semi is that semi-Arianism is impossible, it's an oxymoron. I don't think you can recognize the Nicene Creed with Arianism because either Jesus is the Son of God or Jesus is God himself. Either Jesus is consubstantial with the Father or Jesus is not consubstantial with the Father. Either Jesus was created or he was not created. So you cannot really... Semi-Arianism is a canard. It's a, uh, an impossibility. You know, um, you can't do it. But it says here, you know, yeah... Uh, Semi-Arianism was a position regarding the relationship between God the Father and the Son of God adopted by some 4th century Christians. Though the doctrine modified the teachings of Arianism is still rejected, the doctrine that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-eternal and of the same substance or consubstantial and was therefore considered to be heretical by many contemporary Christians. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not into semi-Arianism. It's either or. Either or. You know, either or. So, but yeah, Constant I think that Constantius II was, you know, semi-Arian because he needed to make a compromise here. I mean, he was obviously the emperor of all the Romans, and, you know, the Romans were divided. There were some Romans who were pagan, some Romans were Catholic, and some Romans were Arian. So he had to come up with a compromise. He was obviously a suppressor of paganism, but he had to compromise between the Catholic subjects and the Arian subjects, and he tried to come up with this semi-Arianism. I think it was just a policy. I think that he himself was Arian, but that as a policy he adopted semi-arianism out of expediency because he needed to you know uh make his government effective uh but yeah um that's just my and that is a hypothesis that is just my hypothesis i have no way of knowing what the emperor constantius ii was thinking nobody does that's just a hypothesis um right so yeah so anyways uh right uh during his reign, he attempted, Constantius II, to mold the Christian church to follow his, this compromise position covering, convening several Christian councils. The most notable of these were the Council of Rimini and its twin at Seleucia, 
which met in 359 and 360 respectively. In 358, the Roman Emperor Constantius II requested two councils, one of the one on of the Western bishops at Ariminium and one of the Eastern bishops. Plan for Nicomedia were actually held at Seleucia in Isauria to resolve the Arian controversy over the nature of the divinity of Jesus Christ, which divided the 4th century church. Yeah, and you know, this issue of Arianism during the 4th century was the hot issue, right? Um, yeah, it would seem that orthodoxy, that, that the anti-Aryan perspective won, but Arianism continued in the underground, right? Because, for example, it re-emerged later with, um, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the King uh, Theodoric of uh, the Ostrogoths and, uh, you know, with Bishop Gulfilas, who was the apostle to the gods. Um, yeah, the Creed of Gulfilas, which I already reviewed in another video. So yeah, um, right. And what were the uh, conclusions of the Council of Rimini? Uh, right. The council was considered a defeat for Trinitarianism. And St. Jerome wrote, quote, the whole world groaned and was astonished to find itself Arian, end quote. So yeah, okay. So uh, the Council of Ariminum rejected Trinitarianism. Good. Great. Great job. Um, oh, yeah. Um, right. Uh, okay. Yeah, of course. The great councils of 359 and 360 are, are therefore not reckoned ecumenical in the tradition of the church. Of course not. Because the Orthodox and the Catholics decide what is the correct tradition. Of course. They're going to suppress councils that they didn't agree with, right? So uh, that's, that's expected. Yeah. Um, but modern people don't have to follow the Council of Nicaea in Constantinople. Uh. All right, so Christian-related edicts issued by Constantius II. One, exemption from compulsory public service for the clergy. Two, exemption from compulsory public service for the sons of the clergy. Tax exemptions for clergy and their servants and later for their family. Tax exemption for land owned by the church, but clergy-owned land not tax exempt clergy and the issue of private property of course uh clergy were allowed to own private property under certain limits right uh bishops exempted from being tried in secular courts so then that's the beginning of you know the whole ecclesiastical uh, uh legal system um yeah and this is really interesting Christian prostitutes only able to be bought by members of the clergy or other state-approved Christians. And of course, the place where clergy could buy Christian prostitutes were the brothels for the clergy, right? And of course, the tradition, the great tradition of brothels for the clergy was sanctioned by the Orthodox and Catholic, you know, pious Orthodox and Catholic uh, believers in the Trinity and that Jesus is God. All the way up to the time of Luther, because one of the things that happened when Luther came to Rome is he noticed that there were brothels for the clergy, and that is one of the reasons Luther said that Rome was a cesspool. Well, apparently the same thing happened in Constantinople, since uh, you know the Emperor Constantius uh, passed an edict saying that Christian prostitutes only were able to be bought by members of the clergy or other state-approved Christians. And that buying, of course, took place in brothels for the clergy, which were sanctioned by the Orthodox uh, religious authorities. So, yeah, anyways, those are the policies concerning Christianity. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and this is why in the past I sort of stayed away from the Emperor Constantius II, is because the Emperor was an anti-Semite right under the rubric that, that the jews killed christ he passed all sorts of legislation that was anti-jewish you know yeah before hitler was constantius ii you know uh yeah you know jews may not marry christian women jews may not attempt to convert christian women any non-Jewish slave bought by a Jew will be confiscated by the state. If a Jew attempts to circumcise a non-Jewish slave, the slave will be freed and the Jew shall face capital punishment. 
any Christian slaves owned by a Jew will be taken away and freed. A person who is proven to have converted from Christianity to Judaism shall have their property confiscated by the state. I mean, horrible. You know, I mean, this is the only time in European history this type of legislation reemerged was under the Nazi government in Germany. You know, so yeah, I mean, before Hitler, it was Constantius II. And that is why in the past I've stayed away from Constantius II. But I've come to re realize that he was the only Aryan emperor, you know. So yeah, the on the on the on the Aryan side he was good, but on the on the anti-Semitic side he was bad. So yeah, you know, he's a mixed bag with Constantius II. And that is why in the past I've stayed away from him. But yeah, I do have to mention him because he was the Aryan emperor, you know. But yeah, but whatever. Anyways, that would be it for this video. Bye.